All right, so as I mentioned, we're in Nehemiah, the ninth chapter. And so just to kind of go back and give you a little bit of, of where we are, they've, they've been reading the law. So they've, the people said they wanted the law read before them. And different from today and then is it, books and things like that weren't as readily available to them. If, if today, if you want to read from God's scripture, it's very easy for us to just get the Bible, open it up, start reading from it. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can even find it on the internet. Everybody has the internet these days. So information is very much at our fingertips today, as opposed to during the time that they lived. Writing, as, a, as everybody knows, like paper and pen and all those things were, were not just common. They just didn't have that sort of thing. It was difficult to have that. So, and you're, and you're probably, your your common people maybe not even been able to read or have been able to read very poorly. And so that's a huge difference. So they're going to get, so Ezra is going to get up in front of the group. He's going to read the law. And so as he reads through that, they recognize what? What do they recognize? They're seeing, they recognize that they haven't been following the law. They even realize there's some stuff in there we haven't been doing. Specifically, he talks about this, this feast of the booze, how they were supposed to you know, live in booze. And immediately when they realized that, they started doing it. So there were, not only were there things that they <clears throat> were ignoring, there were things they didn't even know they were supposed to be doing. And so they find these things out. And so they're continuing to do that. And so that kind of brings us to the ninth chapter here. And uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and read verses one through five of that. Now on the 24th day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting and sackcloth and with dirt upon them. The descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquity of their fathers. While they stood in their place, they read from the book of the law, the Lord their God, and a, for a fourth of the day, and for another fourth of the day, they confessed and worshiped their gods. Now on the Levites' platform stood Jeshua, Bani, Kad, Kadmiel, Shebini, Bunny, Sherebah, Bani, and Chinania, and they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabini, Sherebiah, Hoda, Shebani, and Pethenah said, Arise, bless the Lord your God forever and ever. So you're gonna now you know why I'm not gonna read through all the genealogies because I can't I can't pronounce those words um, those names. It's a good thing we don't name our kids those names nowadays. All right. So there's something interesting about this that some of the commentators notice that neither Nehemiah nor Ezra is mentioned in this passage in this section of scripture here. And so the assembly. So if a lot of times in a movement, we have this term called a grassroots movement. Everybody knows what that means. That means it comes from the people, right? So that means like if there's a grassroots movement, what you know, that means that the, this is something the people want. The people have kind of got together and said, hey, we want this. And so they make the argument that this is kind of like a, a grassroots type movement. The people are desiring to have the law read because they want to be faithful to God. And also, one of the things that pointed out is this, this day that they are, the 24th day of this month, this was not like a day when they were required to assemble or a holy day. This would have been just like a, a regular Tuesday, okay? And so all the people have gathered there on this non-specific day. They're continuing. Obviously, they're continuing these things, but they've stayed past their time. And so they're here on this non-specific day, hearing the law, and it says that they listened, they read the law for a fourth of the day, and what did they do for the other for another fourth of the day? They prayed, they confessed their sins, right? 
because they recognized that they had been living and not keeping the law. Now, I don't want to get caught up on this fourth of the day stuff because if you, if you read some of the commentaries, people love to fall into like, you know, a rabbit hole with that kind of stuff. So let's just recognize that for a portion of the day they read and then for another portion of the day they confess. And it doesn't seem like this was a short period of time. No matter how you break it up, if you say a fourth of the day being 24 hours or a fourth of the day being the daylight, or if, if you want to divide it up into like our regular work day, eight hours, which I'm sure it wasn't, that would be a couple of hours of, you know, reading and a couple of hours of confessing. So it's not like it's a, we confess our sins, let's go, let's go. This was something that they sat down to do and they did it for an extended period of time because I think they took it seriously, right? Whenever you take something seriously, you want to, you know, do it, you know, make sure you do a good job and spend the time on it. Also, we see that they, they put on sackcloths and put dirt on themselves. What, what's the, What's the significance of that? What was, because we don't have that in our society today, do we? So in the last chapter, we talked about last week, um, they were, they wept when they originally heard the law read. And then I told them it's not the time for weeping, it's a celebration time. But now all the celebrations are all over. And so now they realize, okay, it's the time to mourn for our sin. All right, so Mike says, earlier they talked about in chapter 8 how it was not a time for mourning or weeping, but it's a time of celebration. Now they see that they're mourning. So this idea of putting on the sackcloth and putting the dirt is how they showed their mourning during this, in this society. And we see that, you know, throughout the scriptures. I, I can't think of any example today of somebody that mourns by, you know, rubbing dirt on themselves. Um, it's just not part of our culture, I guess. Um, but we see that this is how they show it. And that's a way, I, th I think, I think they're kind of symbolizing their humility, right? That they're not worthy, maybe is is I don't know. That, that's just my just my thoughts. Could be could be wrong, but I think this is a definitely a sign of confession and repentance. <clears throat> and also, I think we see that they completely separate themselves from any foreigners. We know they were forbidden to marry for, foreigners, but they completely put everybody as a foreigner out of this um, out of this because they know they're not to be, um, you know. To, to signify, I guess, their purity um, of following God, if that makes any sense. Anybody have any, any thoughts or comments on this section? All right, let's go ahead and, and look at this, at this next section, at this next section. And so this section is a, is a prayer that, is going, they're going to get up and they're going to lead this prayer. And it seems to me, as I understand it, the priests are the ones that, that are going to get up and say this prayer. And they've probably had this prayer because you know, it's fairly lengthy and fairly, not fairly, but it's very, you know, very linear in history. So it's probably something they have pre-prepared. And so my thought is that this idea is this is something that they've been thinking about and they've gone to some work to make sure they've done some attention to some detail. Um, it says this is the longest recorded prayer that we have in the scriptures is this particular prayer. And a lot of it's going to deal with history. So they're going to go back through their history in this prayer. Um, if we look at verses five and at the end of verse five and six, it says, arise, bless the Lord, your God forever and ever. Oh, oh, may your glorious name be blessed and exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. So they start out this prayer, much like other prayers that are recorded in Scripture, by praising God. And so this is not necessarily like there's, there's, in prayers, there's praise and there's thanksgiving. They're praising God. They're talking about his majesty, about his glory and his power and all the things that he has done that sustains life. And this talks about his name. Um, 
And this idea here in verse um, I can't see it here, but it talks about, you know, his name being glorified. And so we know that God, you know, he is the, the I am. And so I think it's the idea that, you know, his name is the one that's to be glorified. And we're going to see, we'll talk about that a little bit more in shortly. Um, any thoughts or comments on verses five and six? Okay. We may move some of, through some of this fairly quickly. So if, but if you, if you have a comment or, a thought you'd like to add, just please jump in and 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 I'll, I'll take all the help I can get. Um, all right, let's look at verses seven and eight. It says, you are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out, of, out from Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanite, of the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite to give to his descendants. And you have fulfilled your promise for you are righteous. So this prayer begins with Abraham. Why do you think they go back to Abraham? Why not Noah? Why not Adam? All right, because... He was the, the one that God promised to make the nation out of, right? And they are trying to reestablish that nation or God's kingdom here in Jerusalem, which is the land that God promised to Abraham. So I think that's, that's why they go back to Abraham. Also, one of the other things I read was there's a, maybe a parallel between Abraham and being called out of the Chaldees or the Chaldees to go to the promised land. And these people had been in, some of them had probably been in that very same land where Abraham was. Cause remember they scattered the Israelites when they took them into captivity. So they may have been called out of the very same land to return to Jerusalem. I don't know if you can, if that's, I don't, I just think that's interesting, an interesting fact to look at. Um, also, they look at talk about God's generosity towards Abraham, how he chose him, and he, get, he gave Abraham these promises. And he said it, it was done because of Abraham's um, his faithfulness, but it also talks about you have fulfilled your promise for you are righteous. So they recognized that God had given Abraham these, these promises and God had completely fulfilled that. Why? Because God is righteous. God always upholds his promises. And that's something that I think they were, in this prayer they're establishing, they, that's something that they can really grab a hold of, right? God is going to fulfill his promises. So now if they go to God in prayer with repentance and confession, what can they expect to get from God? They can expect forgiveness, right? If you go back and look out through all of Israel's history, when the people turned to God, what did God do? He restored them, right? Look at the judges. Look how many times that happened. People turned away. He restored them. What about us today? What can we grab a hold of? What can we feel sure of? Has God made any promises to us? Or he has. What can we, whenever we confess our sins and repent and return to him, whenever we put away sin and follow him, what can we fully expect? Forgiveness, right? Because God is faithful. God is righteous. Not that it's something we deserved or earned because, because of who God is. And so I think in that same way, we can look at that these people here that have returned to Jerusalem can look at that the same way. Any thoughts or comments on that?
Yeah, absolutely. We, we like to say, you know, his promises are conditional upon their faithfulness. But sometimes I think his promises are part of his promise is the, uh, the curse part, right? So it's conditioned upon us being faithful and them being faithful. But part of the promise is I promise you that if you don't do these things, you're going to receive the curses. And so whenever, and I think this is kind of covered in this prayer, whenever the people are unfaithful to God and he punishes them by causing a drought or having an enemy come and carry them into a foreign land, is God suddenly unrighteous when he does that? No, he's like 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 Brady said, he's keeping his promise. God continues to be righteous because he is continuing to keep his promise and fulfill his word, what he spoke to the children of Israel. Any other thoughts or comments? All right, let's look at this section here, um, nine through fifteen. It says, You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. Then you performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants and all the people of his land, for you knew that they acted arrogantly toward them and made a name for yourself as it is to this day. You divided the sea before them, so they passed through the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the pursuers you hurled into the depths like a stone into raging waters. And with a pillar of clouds you led them by day and with a pillar of fire to light them to light for them the way in which they were to go. Then you came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven, and you gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. So you made known to them your holy Sabbath and laid down for them commandments, statutes, and law through your servant Moses. You provided bread from heaven from their hunger, for their hunger. You brought forth water from a rock, for them for their thirst and you told them to order and possess the land which you swore to give to them so here we see that god they recognize that god looked at their his people when they were slaves in egypt and then it says he performed wonders and signs for pharaoh that's excuse me that's specifically talking about the plagues showing god you know showing pharaoh you know, to get them to let them go and then one of the interesting things I see here is says, and you toward them and made a name for yourself as it is to this day. I want to just kind of think about that for a second. Do you think that the people living in that time, especially the ones around Egypt, knew the name of Pharaoh? Do you think they knew the gods, the name of the gods that the Egyptians worshipped? Of course they did. That would have been common knowledge. That would have been like me asking you who the president is. Um, and so we see that Pharaoh and those gods, they had a name that everybody knew and recognized, right? Do you remember what Moses asked God in the wilderness about God's name? What did he say? Who am I going to say you are? How am I going? So did they, I think the idea is, did God have a name at that time? He did, but was it as wide known by the people probably as Pharaoh? Probably wasn't before, right? At the end of the Exodus, do you think anybody knew God's name? You remember the people in Jericho? Remember what they said? They knew that their God, what he had done to Pharaoh. So God, through those actions, had glorified and his name. And I think that, that by telling the story, they're continuing to glorify God's name is kind of the thought that I have with that. Um, any other thoughts on that specifically? I also think that in this section, they recognize how God gave them these laws yeah, at Mount Sinai. What does it say about these laws? These laws are burdensome and get in our way. 
Is that what it's, this, this prayer says? Is that sometimes how we look at God's law? This keeps me from doing the things I want to do. What does it say about God's laws here? Just and right. My verse says just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. So the, thing, the laws that God gave them were good. It also says that he made, to, made known to him his holy Sabbath. Um, I think one of the things I read, we don't have any record of or any knowledge of people keeping the Sabbath prior to the Exodus, do we? Remember that? Well, what was, there was kind of two things that they were supposed to remember. We're well, not kind of, but there were two things they were supposed to remember when they kept the Sabbath. And they represented a couple of things. What was, what was the first one? Y'all remember? On the seventh day of the week, seventh, on the seventh day of creation, God did what? He rested. It was also later told that it was to remember their time when they were brought out of Egypt. So that was the things, that, the types of things they were supposed to be remembering and doing on the Sabbath. And so th this is, the Sabbath is established there at Mount Sinai. It wasn't, even though it remembers something that goes long before, it remembers all back to creation. So God established it there, even though it remembers something way prior to the Sabbath. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how he, you know, how he fed them in the wilderness and provided water for them. Clearly we can see that there's no way that a vast nation of people could survive in a desert with no food, but God miraculously provided the manna and gave them water and sustained them. And it talks about how if you go back and look at the Exodus chapter and in here, it talks about how their clothes didn't wear out and their shoes didn't wear out. I don't know about you all, but I can wear out. If I wear, like I have a pair of boots I wear to work, I wear them every day. Those shoes wear out fairly quickly. And I only wear them for part of the day. So you can imagine, you know, these people, you know, it was a miraculous thing that God didn't allow their clothes to wear out. And I bet you that my boots are made out of better materials than they had. Um, but we see that God did that miraculously. Um, okay, any thoughts on this on this section here? All right. Also, at the end of this, it talks about how they entered that they entered the land and possessed them. And now it gets into the uh, the, the next section. Uh, we'll read uh, sixteen down through about. 21, but they, our fathers, acted arrogantly. They became stubborn and would not listen to your commandments. They refused to listen, and you did not remember your wondrous deeds, which you had performed, and, and did not remember your wondrous deeds, which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. All right, I'll stop there. The people, after they came out of Egypt, says they became stubborn. They wouldn't listen to the commandments. They even appointed somebody to take them back to Egypt. So in reality, what did they do? God had put Moses as their leader. And through some type of appointment, election, mass, people getting together, they wanted to appoint somebody to take them back to Egypt. So they were trying to overthrow God's leader, right? So they were overthrowing, they were returning their back on God is who they're doing. So they're rejecting God through that process. But it says that God was still... It says, but you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, and you did not forsake them. In verse 18, even when they made for themselves a calf of molten metal and said, this is your God who brought you out from Egypt and committed great blasphemies, you and your great compassion did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not leave them by day to guide them on their way, nor the pillar of fire to light them 
light for them the way in which you were to go. So here we see that they, we all know the story. They got all their gold, they threw it in the fire and supposedly out came this calf and they started worshiping it, claiming that was the God that brought them out of Egypt. Again, they're rejecting God in, bit, in a big way, right? But God continues to be gracious and forgive them. And he continues to provide his blessings to them. And then in verse 20, it says, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Your manna did not withhold from their mouth and you gave them water for their thirst. Indeed, 40 years, you provided for them in a wilderness and they were not in want. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet swell. You also gave them kingdoms and peoples and a lot of them as a boundary. They took possession of the land of Sahan, the king of, of Heshbon, and the land of Og, the king of Bashan. So here we see that he continued to provide for them physically. You made their sons as numerous as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land which you told their fathers to enter and possess. So the sons of Israel entered and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land of the Canaanites, and you gave them in their hand with their kings and the peoples in the land to do with them as they desired. They captured fortified cities and in a fertile land. They took possession of houses full of every good thing, hewn cisterns, vineyards, olive groves, fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and reveled in your great goodness. So here we see that they continue to praise God for all the things that he did for them. He did for them. You see, he gave them the land. It was a land, whenever they went into it, already had, I'm going to call it infrastructure, right? Houses, cisterns, vineyards. It wasn't like they, you know, wandered into a wilderness, like an idea of maybe as the people, you know, marched, you know, moved westward in the United States, they didn't go out there and move into a city. They went out there and there was nothing there was trees and and animals and you know so here we see that god gave them something that was already built and it says that they grew fat and reveled in your great goodness um i don't know i don't know if that's the idea that they grew fat and didn't think about god anymore or if that is just telling how good the blessings of God were. Uh, I think eventually we're going to see that they they take these things for granted here in the next section, and they're going to rebel and become disobedient. But I think that is the idea of this, this growing fat and, and reveled in the, your goodness is that talking about it is, is reflective of how good the blessings that God had given them were. Um, anybody have any thoughts on this section? I went through that section relatively quickly. Dempsey?
Yeah, they continue to appeal to God's graciousness and to his willingness to forgive them whenever they confess and, and return to him. Any other thoughts? All right, I think we're down here to about verses, uh, we'll read 26 and 27. So this is after they've entered into the land, but they came but they became disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs and killed your prophets who admonished them so they might return to you and they committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you delivered them in the hand of their oppressors who oppressed them. But when they cried to you in the time of their distress, you heard from heaven and according to your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who delivered them from the land of their oppressors. But as soon as they had rest, they did evil again before you. Therefore, you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies. So they ruled over them. When they cried again to you, you heard from heaven. And many times you rescued them according to your compassion and admonished them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted arrogantly and did not listen to your commandments, but sinned against your ordinances by which if a man observes them, he shall live. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not listen. What part of their history do you think this section is talking about? The judges, right? Where the people would turn their back on God and he would, you know, raise somebody up to oppress them and they would return to him and he was gracious and then he would, you know, restore them. And then it's, you know, talks about as soon as, soon as things got good again, they would turn their back on him again. And then it talks this section in here that I, that I think this sticks out to me. It says, your ordinances by which a man observes them, he shall live. During this time, do you think that is talking about physical life? Because whenever the oppressors would come in, obviously they came in with armies. And we have lots of record where the Israelites, what did they lose in those battles? They lost their physical lives, right? We often see people that turn their back on God. They were punished with physical life. And so by keeping God's laws, it, it kept them alive physically. But what about us today? Is, there, is, there, is this go even further? How does it go further? Ordinances by which a man observes them, he shall live. Does anybody know anybody that was an Israelite during the time of the judges? They're all dead, right? They've all passed away. Clearly, that's been more than a few decades, several thousand years. But what about us today? We're obviously all physically going to die. If we keep God's laws, how are we going to live? And that's obviously it's spiritually, right? Continue to live and have a home in heaven with God for eternity by keeping these laws. It's easy for us to look at these Israelites and say, if you just would have obeyed God, he would have protected you from your enemies. He would have blessed you with these great blessings and you and the enemies wouldn't have come in and you know punished you and carried you off. It's easy to see that, right? Or no? Throughout through the eyes of history, it's easy to recognize that's what happened, right? So for us today, it should be just as easy to recognize that if we're not keeping God's laws, then we're not going to be able to expect this promise of life that he's given us. And so I think that's a parallel that we can make from this statement from their time to our time. Any thoughts or comments on that? Anybody disagree with that statement? All right, where do we get to here? I think we're down to about 32, is that right? Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps covenants 
and loving kindness, do not let all the hardship seem insignificant before you, which has which has come upon us, our kings, our prince, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, on all your people, from the days of the king of Syria to this day. However, you are just in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. For our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your admonitions with which you have admonished them. But they in their own kingdom with your great goodness, which you have given them with the broad and rich land you set before them, did not serve you or turn from your evil deeds. So here, I think in this section, they start talking about, they quit talking about the historic, the history of God's relationship with the Israelites, and they turn to their current situation, I think. And he talks about how they start this section out once again by praising God, talking about how he's great and mighty and awesome and his faithfulness on keeping their commandments. And then they appeal to him and says, don't let our hardship seem insignificant before you. Does that seem like an odd statement to you? Or can you, anybody have any thoughts on why they would make that statement? Ultimately, if God's people turned his back on them, what, did, what would God have had the right to do? To punish them, to turn his back on them, right? To punish them with death? And maybe they think that, you know, another thought I had was God has restored them back to Jerusalem, correct? Even though it's not like it was during when they first entered the land or when David was the king or Solomon. So maybe they're trying to say, we're not ungrateful for what you've already done for us, right? Because he had brought them out of captivity. But they see, as you go on down through here and they read, it says, behold, we are slaves today. And as to the land which you gave to your fathers to eat of its fruit and its bounty, behold, we are slaves in it. They recognize they're back in the promised land, but what do they know they still are? They're slaves, right? Who were they slaves to? The Persians, right? And, and the the rest of this, some of the rest of this goes through and recognizes how they have to give of their, you know, their produce or their fields that they don't have control over their animals. They can come and take them. And so they recognize that they are there in the promised land, but they're still slaves to this outside kingdom. How does that compare? I want to read a passage over here in John, the eighth chapter. In verse 37. So I want to compare the attitude of these people to some attitude of the Pharisees here. I'm going to begin in verse 34. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. If I know that you are Abraham's descendant, yet you seek to kill me because of my word, has no place in you. I speak these things which I have seen in my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. So Jesus gives this statement that if we if they commit sin, they're a slave to sin, and that it, if the and so we're going to have to read to verse nineteen. Let's see how the Pharisees answer him. They answered and said to him, "Abraham is our father." Jesus said to them, "If you are Abraham's children, where I need to go all the way down to. I'm sorry, back to verse thirty three. They answered and said, "We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been enslaved to anyone." How is it that you say we will become free? So I didn't go back far enough. But anyway, the idea is that Jesus says he can set them free. And they're saying they've never been slaves to anyone. My question is, what's the difference in the attitude of these people back in Nehemiah's time and the attitude of these Pharisees? All 
All right. They're being honest with themselves. They recognize they are still slaves to Persia. They recognize, I think, that they have been unfaithful to God too, right? The Pharisees, are they, are they under the rule of any other kingdom? They are, right? They're under the rule of Rome the same way these people are under the rule of Persia. But they don't, they don't see that. And so I think this is the idea... The, the big, I think, the attitude of these people, these two groups, shows their repentance, right? The Pharisees, obviously, they didn't think they had done anything wrong. If you don't think you've done anything wrong, then how are you going to repent from that, right? Because you're not. Because I, if I don't think I've done wrong, I'm not going to repent or confess. Or, But these, the people here in Nehemiah's time recognized they had sin and they were confessing and they were admitting that they were slaves. And so at the end of this, so at the end of this prayer, and this is a basically a covenant, at the end of this in verse 38, it says, now because of all this, we are making an agreement in writing, and on the sealed document are the names of our leaders, our Levites, and our priests. So they took this idea of repenting and trying to renew this covenant with God. As we talked about earlier, this was a, as we think, what was like a, what we would call a grassroots movement. And they're going to put it in a document that needs to be, you know, that they're going to sign and put a seal on it. So are they taking their repentance seriously? They are, and they're making it very formal. There is this, is this a public type confession, you think? If you put a document out there and and not not everybody signed this document, but like the leaders of the tribes of the families, because it would take a long page for everybody to sign. Um, and so we see that they're, and that's what we're going to go through in this next, you know, chapter 10 is going to talk about you know, the names of the people and stuff that would be on that document. But we see that they, this is something that they took seriously and they sealed this document. So this was, this was something that was a true concern to them, not just something they did impassingly. Oh, we're going to repent from that. We're not going to do that anymore. But they went to great effort to show that. Um, I don't think we have a lot of time left for me to jump into chapter 10. Um, Maybe I'll read that first 27 verses. Y'all can watch me stumble over all those names. Or maybe we'll save that for another day. Um, so we'll go ahead and end class there and start in um, chapter 10 next week.